Yeah, hello everybody. I'm super happy that you're still here after you heard that this is not the entertainment stage. Nobody left. I'm quite happy about that. Um, as said, my name is Hannes. Um, I'm the managing partner for Artifact, which is a, a, a consultancy for data-related uh, topics, um, data transformation and data strategies. And um, what I wanted to show you today um, are our seven steps of data-driven marketing. This is not only valid for marketing, but um, in general, if you want to become a data-driven company and if you want to understand and how you work with data, um, we believe that these seven steps um, should help because it's really important because all of you know that data is the new oil. Who heard that claim before? <laughs> Hands up, almost everybody <coughs> really into the topic. Um, yeah. It's even true because if we look at Jan Brecht, the CIO at Daimler, he's saying that with the IT strategy, data is the new oil. His team is shaping the digital future of Daimler and Mercedes-Benz. Yeah. So if he's saying that, then data might be the new oil. I have a slightly different opinion. I do believe it's it has a lot of value, and this is why our business is value and <laughs> valid and we have clients. But as all of you know, this is an oil rig. Yeah, you've seen it before out on the sea. It takes out a lot of data from the sea. But if that data is not properly used, if you don't refine it, you can't do anything. Then oil is just waste. If you refine it, you get lubricants out of it, gasoline and so on. So if you have a lot of data, then you need to build your own refinery as well, because if not, as said, it is of zero use, yeah? And so is data. So what is our refinery? If we look at our clients, we work for Samsung, for L'Oreal, for Adidas, and so on and so forth. If, you, if we look at what the main issues and main challenges with our clients are, it's always these seven steps. You need to, s to start to define a strategy. I will go uh, a little deeper later on. Um, you need to look at the data groundwork. You need to have the right team on board. All of you know it, it's th the case in every business. You need the right technology because you can't use data if you don't have the right tech set in place. You need to analyze it to gather learnings to reuse it and reuse it better. And in our times, it's really, really important to look at digital ethics and digital privacy. Yeah, it's getting more and more important. And you always have to test, learn, and iterate. Okay, defining a strategy, what does that mean? Yeah, do I have a roadmap set in place? Do I know where I want to go as a data-driven marketing company? Um, do I have the right KPI set? I, if I work with data, I need to steer it properly and I need to know how I measure it. Do I have the proper tools and technologies to visualize data? Because data needs to be understood. And it's uh, different if I talk to a data scientist or if I talk to the CEO or to some VP of a company. Yeah? That, that person needs to see something completely different than the data scientist himself. Then um, um, Björn is here from a very great German agency. The question is, how much of it am I doing in-house? and how much of it uh, am I doing with an agency? Uh, uh, what we see is that in every process you do, either if it's a creative process or if you talk about data, it's important that you have knowledge in-house, but at the same time, uh, what we discovered, it is important that you have partners on board that can help you and then are, that are up to speed with the, with the changings happening so rapidly in the topic. Data groundwork, as said previously, yeah, um, it's important to have the right data, not a lot of data. I was explaining earlier that we um, met with clients that talked to us about 40 million data sets and what they wanted to do with it and how cool it is. And then we went into the project, had a look at the data, and it was basically worthless. Yeah? So um, you, you need to have the, the right strategies uh, to use your data, because if you have it only on an aggregated level, you can't use it for real-time communication online. That does not work. Yeah? 
and um, if you have your if your data is delayed, then same applies. You will not do um, real time campaigning. You need to have data enrichment strategy. What is my data? How good is it? And do I have tools and possibilities to uh, make it more worthful? Yeah, there's a lot of possibilities there. And always find uh, ways to gather new data because the more you have, the better you enrich it, the better you use it, uh, the better is it for you as a company. You need the right team. As I said before, you, in your company, you need people um, that understand what they're doing. So don't give that whole topic away. As I said, it's the new oil, or people believe it's the new oil. So you need people in-house that have an understanding on, on how all of this, what I'm explaining you right now, is working. That means you need to become a place where people that work with data want to work. Yeah? We are not such a yeah, well-known brand. I, it was much easier back at Deloitte, or I thought it was much easier back at Deloitte to hire people. But what we see now is that these data guys want to work with us because we have very, very complex or interesting projects. Yeah? If you find yourself in a transformation process, that might be more interesting for a guy uh, than working for a consultancy on an XY project. And always create cross-functional teams. We had that topic earlier too. So um, don't leave the data guys in a silo. Don't leave your business guys in a silo. Bring everyone in your company together because it's important that these people share their knowledge, uh, share the same targets, and get an understanding of what everyone's doing. Yeah, and partners, I talked about the agencies earlier, should be team two. If you work with an agency or if you work with a consultancy such as, uh, such as us, it's not only a, a wish and what we want, <laughs> but it's uh, equally something you should do. Treat them as a partner. They're here to help you, and that's why uh, you need to, to, to treat them on eye level. And now we come to technology. What is in place? If we have a look at our clients, um, since that topic is so, so important, so big, we see a lot of technology that our clients already bought. And we see a lot of redundancies at the same time, yeah? because people uh, um, change, uh, data managers or VP data change, and everyone brings in their own technology. So it's really important that you bring uh, your, your stack together, yeah? and that you clean up your technology stack and, and, and use only what you really need. Yeah? We talk about full stack uh, versus best of breed uh, strategies. What does that mean? Best of breed means you take the best tool for, for, for the topic you have. Let's say you need a data management platform. You take that out from one provider. Uh, you need a social listening tool. You take that from the other provider and then bring that together to your stack versus you take Google, Adobe, whomever, one company that can provide you the technology for almost all. Yeah. Try with this, with the right data, with the technology you, you use to get a 360 view on your customer. Yeah. In, in, in the perfect world, you should, should know uh, the right customer at the right time, and you should be able to send him the right offer to make him convert. And all that, I'm hurrying up a little because I'm delaying already. All that needs to be measured, yeah? Because only uh, what you're measuring uh, can create more value. That means become an insight-driven organization. If you work with data, try to gather insights out of everything. Why did that customer come on my page, spend so much time, then jump away? Uh, why do I have... Um, why do I try to attract older customers but only young ones buy? Yeah, try to really understand, and this is why you need data scientists or people that know how to work with data. Uh, try to get insights out of your work with the data. Yeah? And uh, this is why you have agencies like Ogilvy. Try to improve the customer experience. You can attract people, potential customers, whomever, with data, but when, you're cu when the customer experience of your product, of your brand, of your websites and whatsoever is not good, then it's uh, money lost and money wasted. Privacy and digital ethics, yeah, um, 
digital ethics is one of the top trends, uh, at least Gartner says that, for 2020. What does that mean? Um, how will you as a company or as a, uh, an individual um, uh, move in the digital world? For example, you're, you're a private person, you're a father, is it okay for you to post photos of your kids? Um, is it okay for you to waste the internet with uh, political comments and so on and so forth? It, what is your ethical belief? And the same must be done um, if you're a company. Yeah? Uh, on which pages uh, is it important for you to make uh, advertising and on which you shouldn't? And s most of it is be done automatically. This is why you need the right data and the right tech stack. If not, you as a sustainability company uh, will find your advertising on, I don't know, on some company that's selling plastics yeah, or, or on, a, on, a, on a block that's talking about, about rigging oil. Uh, and this is not good for your brand safety. Yeah. So um, lots of people uh, have a, a digital ethics officer now in place. There's some good um, good websites online that I could uh, that, that you should have a look into. Uh, it's the Oxford Oxford Institute for Digital Ethics. Uh, can be of help if you want to understand on um, how you should uh, should go along with that topic. Then test and learn. I bet most of you can't hear that. <laughs> that that uh, that word anymore. Be agile. Yeah. Um, don't do very very long term project. Try to create little test and learn environments with again cross functional teams um, uh, to to bring prototypes on the street very fast instead of doing big waterfall projects. Yeah. Be open to change. Be open to failure. If something's not working out, you will again gather insights, learning from it, and you will have a second and a third chance in the digital world. Yeah? Digital transformation does not exist. I really like that line. Why? Because transformation has a beginning and an end. And what we're seeing right now and where we are right now, this is an ongoing pro process with all the technological changes and all the changes in the market, um, it will uh, never have an end. That's at least what I believe. And in the end, forget silos. Yeah? If you start these sort of projects and then people in the company think, no, this is my project, no, it's my project. If you want it to be a success, then open your silos in the company. If not, again, it's wasted money. It won't be of any help uh, and it won't, will never be a success. So, conclusion. Data is of zero use if not refined. Follow the seven steps or if it's too many, then at least follow the strategy and the data groundwork steps, yeah? Because plants are nothing and planning is everything. Every one of our customers has huge plans, but really nitty gritty plan on what the next steps are and keep on moving, that's what needs to be done. Yeah? And in the end, uh, very important data groundwork. What are you doing with your data? Yeah? A lot of data versus the right data. And so don't be an oil rig, yeah? be a refinery. This is it. Thank you. Thank you very much for these insights. Are you in a coma now? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, man. she didn't. Yeah, just you kidding. Fell asleep. Thank you. Thank you for these uh, for these <laughs> insights. And um, I've taken with it. It's not about planning. It's about doing. It's about refining. Uh, the and uh, we're now coming to a guy who's called Bjorn, uh, and he's he's doing that. He's doing a lot of stuff. He's a very creative guy. I mean, he just told me um, he actually wanted to study mathematics. Uh, but he couldn't find a university that was near a skiing resort. So uh, he ended up in Kempton uh, studying business. Uh, he today is the chief creative officer of Ogilvy, one of the largest creative agencies in, uh, in Germany. And before ending up at uh, a COO of uh, Ogilvy in Germany, his, and I have to put my glasses back on because there are so many international cities from London, New York, Amsterdam, uh, at uh, agencies like Gray, DDB, MC, Saatchi, uh, Weiden, Weiden, Weiden and Kennedy. Is it Weiden or M. Kennedy in English? Yes. Um, so um, 
there is a whole bunch of creativity inside of you, and we, oh, meanwhile, already switched to your presentation, so I'll hand it over to you. Welcome up on stage, uh, Bjorn Bremer. Uh, right, uh, good, good day, I guess. Uh, I feel quite honored to be here. Um, as you just heard, um, I'm not really a data guy. I used to play football, and in the last two years, I basically had to switch to PlayStation football, which is sort of what I'm doing right now. It's the same sort of idea, but it's really different watching Ronaldo than playing Ronaldo. Um, but, um, and actually, I'm quite happy to be here because I'm going to talk about one case. Uh, and I took the train, uh, and I'm not delayed, so very good. I'm glad I was the second presenter, so I had more chance to be right on time. A who had problems with being delayed with German Rail? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> what does that mean? That means you all are potential customers of mine, or us, or my beloved client. Because, uh, as I said, we work for German Rail. Uh, it's a huge business. Uh, there are almost 150 million passengers each year. Still, uh, there is a huge problem. Usually, uh, sorry, uh, around September, October, November, half the trains are empty. If you don't take the train Friday afternoon or Monday morning or Sunday evening, the trains tend to be very empty. And our job is basically to make sure that the trains aren't as empty as they are. So they have this genius idea. Uh, every year, you basically get a train ticket for 19 euros. Wherever you want to go. You want to go to Sylt, or not Mumbai, unfortunately. Sorry, New Delhi. Or you want to go to Potsdam, or whatever. It's 19 euros. Great. And for 13 years, as I said, we played football. And we did stuff like this. Not very creative. Wonderful city light posters. They were at the train stations. They were at, I don't know, bus stations. And says, oh, small price, big you know, happiness, the super duper, super, super spa boys, 19 euros. Uh, so that's what we did playing football for 13 years. Last year, they said, we need this again, but we have a problem. We have budget cuts. Who has heard of budget cuts? <laughs> right, brilliant. So uh, we said, okay, well, budget cuts. Let's do something crazy for a change. And now, you've got to see, we're talking German Rail here. That's a state company. It's not coal companies, not something crazy. Um, and then somebody had this genius, great idea and said, oh, let's do marketing automation. I know for 90% in this room, this is not crazy. You know, look at us. It's very crazy. Okay? The problem with marketing automation is, I hope this works. Right. We compare marketing automation to a hotel, automatic hotel door. Right person, right time, right product. I stand in front of the door, the door opens, I walk through. Great. Right time, I stand in front of it, right person, I want to go through, right product, door opens. Brilliant, 200%. If, I mean, it would be stupid if it doesn't open, dong. But apart from this, this is marketing automation. The problem is, I don't know which automatic hotel door ever created any preference for that hotel. You know, if you have a hotel boy there, he can help you get a taxi, he can say good day, he can help you with your luggage. You know, you leave the hotel, you don't know where to go, he puts you in a direction, stuff like that. He creates a preference for that hotel. That automatic door is super duper, super efficient, saves money, but it doesn't create preference. So we said, well, marketing automation is great, but, sorry, we need to add some creativity. And this is where Hannes and I agree, and no, it's not very good for a panel that people agree. You want people to disagree, but we do agree. Uh, we both are both believers in, you, if you have the data, you can have all the data in the world, now you have to do something interesting with them. You have to refine them, 
you have to shape them, you have to turn them into some kind of magic, because otherwise it works here, but not here, like the automatic door. So we, the football players, came up with this idea. This is a wonderful Venice, which also looks like wonderful Hamburg. However, the flight is 120 euros and the train is 19 euros. So you basically get the same thing for uh, a tenth of the price. <laughs> Not bad, but the problem is, again, and that's where marketing automation comes in, and if you don't do this, is actually quite a nice poster, uh, but we don't know if you want to go to Venice, or if you want to go to Mumbai, or to Cape Town, or to, who wants to go to Sydney? <laughs> right, good. Problem with Sydney is the flight is quite expensive, right? So we found all these look-alike pictures, and we found where people want to go, and then turned it into a campaign that a lot of people talk about right now, which uh, rather than me stumbling presenting, we put a little film together for you to see. I hope it works. This was just the beginning. Then we asked ourselves, how can we bring relevance and attention to each comparison on social media, real time? The answer, with data and technology. Using an algorithm, we found lookalike photographs on Getty Images. Through Facebook data, we identified travel enthusiasts who are interested in specific destinations. For example, Lucas. Geo-targeting pinpoints Lucas' current location and the airport closest to him. Another algorithm finds the destination airport. This data is sent to a search engine that identifies the cheapest flight price in real time. We then show Lucas how much the cheapest flight costs and make him an unbeatable counteroffer, completely automated in an infinite number of variations. Turning a unique visual idea into a real-time social media price comparison that moved Germany. I guess to call it just marketing automation wouldn't be slightly unfair. It developed over a couple of months. Uh, there were lots of uh, GDPR, obviously, almost killed it uh, twice, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, but this friendly company of this woman helped a lot with Facebook and anonymizing all the data for us. Uh, there was great help by Getty Images, who basically gave us a flat line to use all the buy routes uh, for the images. Uh, so it was a great collaboration and a great uh, piece of work, and I think for us it's a great, great example of what we mean with you can have all the data, but if you don't put a creative twist on the data, it might work here like a hotel door, but it doesn't convince you to buy actually something. So um, that's pretty much it, what I wanted to show you, short and sweet, and let's, do you want to talk? Uh, first of all, That's very, uh, very impressive. Yeah. Thank you for you not putting us in the lunch coma. Just this one, huh? uh, <laughs> <laughs> now your towel is missing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why I said he can sit down here. All right. Yeah. Just perfect. <laughs> yeah. He reserved the seat before, so. We have Alina. Um, do we have questions from the audience? Yeah, we have Alina. If there are questions, uh, just wave in the direction of Alina. She will be running around uh, because she has a mic, so uh, we all can hear you. 
Uh, yeah, now they are, they, after we'll, lunch, we'll they are too shy. Yeah, after lunch, okay. we'll just, yeah. Then, w then we start with our questions and just we try to um, look around here and Alina will walk around and if you, when you see her raising the microphone, then it's all yours. Um, is, uh, you told me earlier um, about uh, predictive analytics. Um, how is that? Um, how is that working in with your normal clients? Do they understand what predictive analytics? Does everybody know what that is? Hands up. Who knows that? Okay. What is predictive analytics? <laughs> Half the room doesn't know that. Um, yeah, predictive analytics is so, sort of the future teller by using data. So. Um, Marketing was, I guess, one of the first industries really working a lot with data. And um, uh, what we did at Artifact was uh, gather these learning to use it for other use cases. So, I mean, even what you just sh showed has some sort of prediction in it. But what we did, we took it away from the whole marketing world and our helping our customers um, by gathering a lot of data and doing predictions on, for example, uh, demand sensing yeah, uh, for Carrefour in France, for example, um, on what they need to have in the shop when the right customer is coming through the door. Yeah? So we take a lot of data like bank holidays and when are women pregnant, how's the weather and so on and so forth, but uh, many, many touch points to really um, understand on how you, so should stock, uh, you should stock the company. Uh, you just mentioned Carrefour. Uh, you had a big project with them. Yeah. Um, do still they still have you still yeah, have yeah. the project? Uh, can you talk about like what the project is about and um, how you could uh, convince the customer that they that they need data driven marketing? Yeah, I mean they knew they needed something because they were losing a lot of money because they didn't have the right product on time um, um, in the offline world, which is the same for the online world. Um, but I think what was cool um, with uh, th with Carrefour was that they followed a lot of the seven steps we were just saying, or at least parts of them. Means it was lift from the CEO. It started with a tiny little project with a, a, a mix mix of brains, a mix of teams, w with a mix uh, of people from tech providers, our company, and from Carrefour in an independent office with an independent IT infrastructure uh, and has now grown to a 75 people company, I'd say, that's taking care only of this. And, and this shows how you can start with uh, little money if you tear down the boundaries and the silos uh, and, and make a project a success. Um, and mean saying that they um, s now saving a lot of money because they have your help. Mm -hmm. So it's like everybody should le learn from that. Do you, I mean, when, when we see examples like the one you just presented, and, and when I think about, I mean, all these Twitter profiles and, 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 and all the other information that is out there, I mean, we most of the data is somewhere out there. So um, we talked a lot about interdisciplinary people coming together, and that's probably true in your case as well. You need a creative guy. You need somebody who can refine data. Uh, what, what else do you need to really make these things work? Because... Uh, with all the data out there, it should be a no-brainer, but it practically probably is not because you don't have the right mix of people together. How do you accomplish that? Well, I guess w one key challenge uh, with every project in the beginning, as you just said, is people speak different languages. You have the football players, you have the PlayStation players, you have the uh, handball players, you have American football players. They both say we play football, but one take an egg and one play with a ball. So That's a good one. Uh, it's <laughs> both 11 aside, uh, but and they sort of speak about the same thing because it's about scoring and winning and the team sport, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're the same thing. And um, I can sort of more relate to the creative world. They just come up with, oh, it's totally easy. They read somewhere, somewhere. Like, oh, Google knows that before the woman knows itself that the women are pregnant. So they must know where this guy wants to holiday next summer. Well, it's not quite that simple. Right? And so there's, in the beginning, I guess the first weeks and months of a project is literally just finding the right understanding and words and terms and as, as, as simple as that. And it probably takes something between three to four weeks 
to actually start. So I love the whole be agile, be fast, test and learn thing. Well, you need four weeks to agree what you want to do before you can start test and learn. <laughs> so, but you pro, you know, that's at least our yeah. experience. And I mean, not everybody has excellent uh, connections to Sheryl Sandberg, Facebook, <laughs> Getty. Uh, <laughs> is is this that kind of, of can you do these kind of projects only in this scale or? Would that also be something for Nina's Heckelstube in Potsdam uh, that is only used <laughs> to working with somebody who does SEO uh, so far? Uh, I mean, of course, on a different scale, but so what will you say? Well, uh, it's, it's a tricky question, and it's a uh, what needs to be done uh, question. Because to do, I showed you the post that we did for 15 years. Producing that poster, the printing, and I don't know, the fee for the agency, blah, blah, blah. Just a poster that's, I don't know, 20,000 euros. To create the infrastructure, to do the data mining, to do the conversations with Facebook, with Getty Images, with the lawyers, da, 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 is close to 200,000 euros. So it's the 10 times higher price, right? But obviously then you m win a lot of money because you need a lot less media budget. But if the Hickelstube doesn't even have 200,000 euros media budget, you know, it's hard to, you know, create those savings afterwards. So, so what no needs to be done is, is a very good question. Yeah. And only so do what needs to be done. But I, but I guess if I can add one point that, that never ever in history till today, small companies had so many opportunities than we're having now. Yeah. Because uh, doing some simple Facebook targeting for a thousand euros, two thousand euros, it uh, can be easily done, yeah. Um, bringing up your own, I have a friend, bringing up your own Instagram uh, channel where people start following you and then add on a small Facebook campaign to that. This is how you get it started, yeah, or, or, or starting your YouTube channel to a certain topic that possibility was never given. So um, yeah. we have projects from this uh, to this and, uh, and see possibilities everywhere. And I agree with you, the four weeks, that why we say defining a strategy is yeah. the first, first thing before even get started, and that applies for Nina's Hekelstube as well. Um, think who's your customer, where do you want to go, and what's your plan in going there? So as Nina's Hekelstube, the best strategy would probably be find out where he's skiing, yeah? Go skiing with him, uh, meet for an upper siege and tonic or two, and so get some inspiration, and then you I can even do it on a small budget, uh, at least not <laughs> on that scale, yeah, but uh, it's a good place to start, maybe. Yeah. Well, if you start with a gin tonic, it usually ends up good. I know, yeah, it always, that's what I always <laughs> say. Yeah. Yeah. All the good things start over a glass of wine or two. Or, or a couple. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to come back to, <laughs> not to the Hegelstube, but in general. To the um, gin tonic? <laughs> yeah, gin to the gin tonic. We should invite Nina there. next year. It's a good idea. Let's well find depends. Nina. But I also want want to find Nina in Hamburg because you. I know that you are a member of the Digital Council, at the Hamburg Chamber of Commerce, and I'm pretty sure there are a couple of Nin Ninas there with the small companies. Is is that um, digital marketing or da data driven marketing? Is that also a topic there that small companies are asking? Like, c can we get a solution from you? Yeah, of course. In that council, we try to work on strategies um, even for B2B companies, for classical uh, companies like harbor, uh, people working in the harbor or companies uh, out of the harbor. Um, yeah, I think uh, it, it is a topic we're developing, um, as I just said, staff or little papers on how we can support these little companies uh, in doing so. And um, some of them did, did really successfully. I mean, even 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 if we talk about bi building a website, yeah, you can do that in in ten minutes today, super fancy with a shop in the background and everything. That was never possible, and so we try to help these people uh, out of the chamber of commerce um, uh, to show them on what steps they could follow uh, to bring their business uh, to a, a much broader audience than they did before. And uh, just because you stepped on that topic, the GDPR. No. Um <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. I <laughs> Five minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, and not just because a lot of people are, are raising that question. When you see the campaign and when you talk with small companies, they always say, no, I don't want to step into that because there is GDPR and we don't know if we are allowed to do this and that. So they c where do you start there when you consult companies? Is there is there a 
a pattern you can put on and saying, yeah, we have already the experience, we do it for you. Uh, I think you need to try. It's the same as with your project. Um, with all the stuff you mentioned that's needed, there's always a, a, a courageous a client needed. And what we see, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong or if it's different uh, with you guys, it is that at the moment we have two different sorts of clients. Some that seem to be completely paralyzed because they don't know um, if they should do anything because they're scared of GDPR and others that say, let's try, yeah, because, um, yeah, so uh, there's not yet something in between. I think um, there's solutions to be on the more safer side, uh, but time, time needs to tell on, on where that goes. I think it should also be more, uh, there are obviously official rules. It's kind of a gut feeling. Do you want to see this yourself or not? Do that test. Imagine you're the customer or the consumer, you see it, would you be offended or not? And, and usually the answer you get from this is a very good starting point. And you can either turn it down or turn it up, make sure it works legally, but it's as sim you know, simple <laughs> as that. <laughs> make sure it works legally. Yes. It looks like the microphone is walking up to somebody who has a question. Now here we ah, oh, Thomas again. Yes. <laughs> no. <we> Hello. <laughs> Do you know Thomas from Exocet? <laughs> yeah, um, <coughs> I like asking questions. Um, but uh, the, the, um, this campaign was really fascinating. Um, on a te technological and creative point, but I'm also wondering, did you do any tests and how was the, the targeting really precise enough that all this effort made a, a difference in the user and maybe you showed some click-through rate and stuff like that, but you could have um, just done 12 variations of this much cheaper and be al almost as good, I would suggest. Did you do any testing or find out if it actually m uh, was worth all the extra effort? Uh, I can, if you, there's an official and an unofficial answer. Uh, unofficial, please. The unofficial <laughs> answer is, Let's if take. you if you <laughs> mention that project somewhere in the German rail tower, even the board and the CEO smiles. Uh, it made sense and the uh, return on investment was better than all the previous campaigns, so they're all happy. But apart from that, it also gave them sort of an edge. The first time they did something cooler than Lufthansa, the first time they were cooler than all the <laughs> German car. No, no, this is important. I mean, they're controlled by Berlin and the politicians and stuff, so for the first time they can go up there and say, look, we did something innovative and cool. So the short answer is yes, the return on investment was better than the first 13 years, so thumbs up, even including all the, the efforts. But there was another uh, unqualified financial benefit that they really liked as a, uh, as a company. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I think uh, what you're basically saying, as a campaign and with all the public publicity it got and all the knowledge that was created and yeah. all that, it totally makes sense. I was just also wondering on the individual level of the user getting served that ad if it m made a difference? Well, uh, two things. One, um, the we they sold out the tickets in two-thirds of the time, which is obviously a, a good thing. Uh, the, the previously mentioned budget cuts didn't stop it, so that was good. The problem with testing, it's that would take another two hours to discuss, but these guys, like you probably too, like A-B testing, right? And uh, they obviously see this ad works better than this ad. In this particular case, there wasn't really, it was a comparison about the flight destination and the train destination. You couldn't all of a sudden go, oh, we do bus destinations and train destinations or car destinations and, you know, you see what I mean? And obviously some ads, like the Arizona Ryland were more impactful than maybe Venice and Hamburg. So that individual thing worked better, but Facebook told us this person wants to go to Arizona, so you wouldn't be interested in the Venice ad. So yes, the Venice ad didn't perform as well as the Arizona because it was simply not as spectacular. But then this person wasn't, in so that was another very steep learning curve the, all the data people, what do you mean we can't change stuff? You know, we need to adapt and learn, and make things better, and then we just yeah. put the money behind the ads that work better, and then 
all the creators said, well, hold on, it's not that simple. But this is it, no? Uh, test and learn. I mean, your question is perfect because this is what shows a company that spent a lot of money for 13 years on ads that you showed us, then try something like this and maybe ends up in doing something like you just mentioned, in taking 12 pictures and, and using them, no? Yeah. That's, that's, that's the rotation of the circle, which was already a, a big step for Deutsche Bahn. And 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 to get the learnings out of what happened is ma mainly the most most important thing. Yeah. I guess you agree on my last question uh, uh, again. You might agree um, that this is the future. <laughs> that are you are there c uh, other companies approaching you and saying, "We love your um, campaign. We need to work together." Uh, not as many as there should be, but <laughs> 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 no, we <laughs> no. There were a couple of us, and they come like, "Oh, we want exactly the same thing," and yeah. then we say, "Okay, we can do it." What are, do you have all these data? And then they go, "No, but we have 40 million other data." So they're like, "No, they're not useful." So we tell them, "Talk to this guy first, make sure you get the right data, and then come back to us." That's the future. All right, so don't be afraid of GDPR. Have the right data refinery. Stop planning too much. Start doing. Have a, have a few gin tonics with the management so they get the right <laughs> gut feeling for, yeah. for doing it, and, and then it works. Yeah, if it would be that easy. But <laughs> That's a good recipe. <laughs> in I part, think. it's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll try it next time. Perfect. So thank <laughs> you, Bjorn, and thank you, thank you, Hannes, uh, for uh, having your presentation and, of course, this great discussion at the end. Uh, we now all know how to do it, I think. Well, Please give a big hand to the two.